for as long as any of us can recall, celebrity endorsement has been a staple of um, the marketing landscape. And um, famous athletes, actors, actresses, musicians, and other pop culture icons have always served to promote uh, brands and products. This is because uh, they are likable, consumers want to emulate them, and um, and um, uh, we as consumers want to be associated with that brand as well when it's endorsed by a celebrity. In the best case scenario for brands, um, consumers will buy the product, and in the worst case scenario, well, um, consumers will be aware of that brand because it's being worn by the celebrity. So here is uh, Bette Davis in a 1951 advertisement for um, Lustre Crème Shampoo. And this is a perfect example showing that the service endorsement has been there forever and it's definitely going to stay. Indeed, um, a um, marketing company, Millwood Brown, has um, found that um, the number of adverts featuring celebrities has doubled in 10 years. So it's a cash cow for celebrity, they know it. And um, it's also an increasingly popular strategy to promote consumer goods, especially in the fashion and luxury sectors. There's a positive impact on stock prices, sales, and uh, consumer attitudes and intentions. That is as long as things, as, as long as things go right. <coughs> so um, the power of celebrity endorsement is even greater now in the digital age. Within a, 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 a where sorry, a 140 character tweet with an attached link um, can drive hundreds of thousands of consumers to a brand's website in a matter of minutes. The stakes are higher because of social media um, and um, the, the fact that a celebrity can send that tweet every day uh, and at every moment of, of, uh, of the day and night. And um, also this is all free, free stuff. I mean, the internet is all free and it covers an, an enormous uh, 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 coverage of the of, of um, basically the, of the reach of consumers, and um, um, now brands are conscious of the fact that social media is uh, uh, definitely an important um, uh, an important channel to uh, to promote their products in addition to traditional media such as uh, um, TV, terrestrial TV, and, and radio. So even if those um, traditional media uh, have lost market share, brands are conscious that social media are there and they are going to stay, and uh, the internet is, is, is extremely important today. So while the upside, the upside and scale of endorsement marketing campaigns have increased for luxury and fashion brands with the advent of social media, the downside effects have also exponentially grown. It has become a more risky game for brands to advertise for celebrities because misbehaviors, inappropriate actions, or disparaging words from their endorsers could be known to the entire world almost immediately. Well, uh, Kate Moss became the face of uh, high fashion after she pioneered the grunge, heroine, chic look, replacing tall, statuesque models such as Naomi Campbell to pressure in a new wave of petite, almost wavefish models. Everything was going swimmingly, swim, swimmingly for La Cape like Moss, and uh, she had um, campaigns lined up with H&M, Burberry, and Dior um, in September 2005. Well, she was also the face of um, Chanel's Coco Mademoiselle fragrance. However, it all came for, uh, to a screeching halt when uh, London tabloids ran photos of her snorting cocaine. Fashion brands have always cashed on, uh, cashed in on uh, Moss's party girl image, but when class A drugs disrupted that strategy, they needed to do some major damage control. H&M was the first to pull its ad campaign on uh, the, um, the basis that uh, they um, were doing a lot of charity work with uh, um, anti-addictions and anti-drug addictions campaigns, but um, Burberry also announced that they had cancelled the contracts through mutual consent. Chanel's campaign would continue uninterrupted, but they decided not to renew their contract with Moss. Now, we've heard about this guy, this guy a lot recently. So Uruguay soccer star Luis Suarez currently earns £200,000 a week as a Liverpool FC football player. 
is actually going to move to um, a, a club in Spain soon. In addition, his past sponsorship deals have believed to bring in a not inconsiderable sum of money. With AAA Poker, sportswear and equipment brand Adidas, and Beats owned by uh, Apple now, he's uh, actually get, deriving substantial income from that. By now, almost everyone on the planet is likely to have heard that this footballer has beaten Italian defender Giorgio Chiellini on 24th of June during the game at the FIFA World Cup. In 2013, Adidas had already cautioned Suarez after he beat Chelsea defender Brazilian Ivanovic. He's a repeated offender on that one. He's done it three times already. Every time he was suspended. First time for 10 games. Uh, now this time, uh, the World Cup organization, as well as FIFA, has suspended him for nine games and uh, four months in relation to any activities linked to football. Adidas immediately released a, an advert, sorry, immediately replaced an advert on Copacabana, on Copacabana Beach during the uh, World Cup, featuring the pure white striker with his mouth open and teeth barred. You can see it here. Oh. Um, and an Adidas spokesperson said, and Adidas has decided to review all marketing activities involving Luis Suarez. Some changes on the ground in Brazil have been made in line with this review, in cert in, with certain artwork being swapped out today. I read in the Daily Mail on Sunday that actually Adidas decided to um, stick with uh, uh, Suarez and not to terminate the contract, but um, frankly, it could have had ground to uh, uh, terminate that agreement. Betting site 888 Poker actually did terminate the contract with Suarez. And uh, yeah, icon of golf, uh, of golf, uh, the golf culture. Um, he now sits constantly atop his throne as a top ranked male golfer, but uh, in 2009, uh, things were really derailed for uh, uh, Tiger Woods when his uh, habit of straying caught up with him when, in pictures of his many extramarital affairs were linked by the press. So, despite the fact that he released a formal apology and tried to set things right, um, that didn't have a lot of effect. He was dropped by Gillette, Gatorade, Tagera, the brand with the watch company, Accenture, GM Motors, and ATT. Um, they had all capitalized on the fact that um, Woods was a precise guy with a lot of strength and of, of his skill. This uh, image was shattered by, uh, by his uh, affairs and stuff. So, um, yeah, so those are three examples, one of the biggest examples of how things can definitely go wrong um, for a celebrity and that could have some impact on the brands that uh, they represent. But, I mean, before we we actually look at the legal effects, one question we need to ask ourselves, I mean, how is that affecting the brand? Is it really, you know, tangibly affecting the brand in, in, in terms of figures? I mean, what are we talking about here? Well, um, this is a picture, by the way, before we answer this crucial question, of Rick Ross, um, a hip hop American, sorry, American hip hop singer who endorsed Reebok products and released the song Uo Eino about date rape with the following lyric Put Molly, which means ecstasy, this line, so put Molly all in the champagne, she ain't even know it. I took her home and I enjoyed that, she ain't even know it. The guy was actually very unhappy that Reebok dropped him. <laughs> well, if Sos Murray actually has done some research and they found out that 27% um, uh, of global citizens say they would consider stopping buying a product if the celebrity who endorses it is reported to be engaging in personal misbehavior. And a similar proportion, 25% quarter, say they have already stopped buying the product for that reason. Okay, well, that's a fair amount, you know, um, quarter of the... Of the um, of the global population, but how is that affecting fashion and luxury brands in particular? Well, actually, it is affecting them a lot because out of these 25% glo global citizens, um, the proportion of um, citizens living in countries uh, which are big buyers of luxury and fashion products is very high. For example, in China, 66% of the people interviewed would actually have actually already stopped buying a product um, because it is endorsed by a celebrity who's been engaged in misbehavior. Another important product for fashion and luxury uh, brands is uh, uh, the Middle East. Saudi Arabia, 40% would uh, have already stopped buying products um, 
which were associated with celebrities misbehaving. So, fashion and luxury brands have a lot to lose if one of the endorsers, celebrity endorsers, um, cocks up. And um, they are going to be some loss of sales in the major markets, the Asia in particular, the Middle East, um, and some loss of reputation, loss of customers. In traditional markets, the reactions are less unforgiving. So, for example, data suggests that British consumers are more forgiving of celebrity misdeeds. Just 6% of, um, of the Brits are very likely to stop buying products in the United States. 20% would stop buying products, and in France, uh, for example, 19 same for Germany. So, you know, it is, a, it, is, it is a reality. It is a reality, and uh, brands will suffer, especially fashion and luxury brands will suffer if they celebrity endorsers um, behave badly. And um, are there, by the way, any other reasons why a celebrity um, would, uh, would uh, not fit the bill anymore and um, a brand would want to terminate? Um, this is a montage, just a little aparté, but this is a montage picture of our, our actress Scarlett Johansson, who has signed an endorsement deal with a health drink company that operates out of a, a factory in a settlement in the occupied West Bank in Israel. I understand that those settlements are um, considered illegal under international law through Israel disputes, uh, sorry, though Israel, Israel disputes this. So um, while the ad encourages customers to set the bubble free, there's a quite funny um, ad going on YouTube with her um, basically um, talking about this, uh, this sort of stream the Soda Stream product. So while the ad encourages customers to set the bubbles free, many critics have noted that Palestinians in the zone are not free, hence this uh, montage picture. Um, Oxfam, who had, has had um, Johansson as a brand ambassador for the last eight years, actually dropped her. They didn't want to have anything to do with her uh, because um, they are a human rights group. So um, it's not only consumer brands uh, who drop, that drop celebrities, it's also non-profit organizations. You know, when they, they, the, the celebrities don't align with the, the message they want to pass on to the world anymore. Right, so the second reason for which, uh, why, for which a celebrity endorsement can be ris is risky is due to the fact that if a brand ambassador is overexposed by constant appearance in the media, there is no separation between the celebrity's frame and the brand endorsed. Um, there is a risk that the celebrity will overshadow the brand sparkle. And proper example of that is Joey, jo Angelina Joey, Jody, sorry, uh, being the endorser of the fashion brand St. John, which uh, I'm afraid I've never heard of. But um, apparently it was being, I mean, I suppose it's very successful in the United States. And from 2005 until 2008, she was the ambassador. But things didn't work out because with Jolly being involved with Pat Pitt and they were six children and her having roles, of course, in the, the Hollywood industry, but also as a peace um, um, ambassador with UNESCO, etc. She was uh, in the news all the time, so uh, St. John just dropped her. Third reason why your celebrity endorsement goes wrong is the lack of coherence between the celebrity's personality and the brand's value and image. Jessica Parker is, um, sorry, Sarah, Sarah, Sarah Jessica Parker is known for um, uh, basically her association with um, high, fashion, high fashion because of her role in Sex and the City. And when Gap chose her as um, the representative of this brand, which is much more into the, um, into the uh, main market, like the mainstream market branch, uh, consumers of uh, Gap products who could not identify with uh, Sarah Jessica Parker, who prefers to wear Madelou Vanik and uh, Chanel. So um, Gap suffered a loss of revenues, and um, they uh, replaced her swiftly with um, uh, singer John Stone. So in the, the fallout from the Lance Armstrong doping scandal for businesses, aligned with him for endorsement or sponsorship deals, there was, this was the moment where many brands and their advisors started measuring the impact of reputation and brand risks when such relationships with celebrities go wrong. A lot of articles and interviews about how to protect the brands were published and broadcast then 
because the Armstrong case raised additional awareness of the risk management step businesses can take as they associate themselves with celebrity spokesperson. Now, there are quite a few steps, I mean, I think that there are a few steps to, uh, to comply with when you want to make sure that your endorsement by a celebrity uh, personality is going to work out. The first uh, step is to do some due diligence. Second one, I would suggest, is to negotiate some protective contractual terms, of course. Then the third step would be to get some insurance for disability, disgrace, or death of the celebrity. Some ongoing monitoring of the relationship with the celebrity is requested. And if necessary, make use of the termination rights provided for in the contract. And finally, have a pre-planned crisis management media strategy in place in case things go pear shape. Now, the third step is to research whether the celebrities, the proposed celebrity has done and said anything in the past that might harm the brand. So it's not just a matter of having you know, the, uh, the intern researching the internet by googling in the name of the celebrity and then the brand. It needs to be thorough, professional, and detailed research. The ad agency, because very often those brands are, sorry, those deals are proposed by brand agencies, ad, ad agencies, apologies. So the um, ad agency, ad, ad agency proposing the celebrity should present the results to the client, i.e. the brand. It, the, it should uh, show them that um, it has done the due diligence, and if anything has cropped up, then the ad agency, agency should let the client be the one to take a view on whether or not to proceed. At least you know they're informed, and it's up down to them to take the decision. When starting to negotiate the endorsement agreement, it is crucial to include an undertaking that the celebrity has disclosed all incidents in the past that could affect the endorsement value. So they sign, I represent, but I've never said, done, you know, anything in relation to uh, this, 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 and this. That's a, a, a must-have in, uh, in the endorsement contract. The advertiser and its advertising agency must also understand and accept the existing reputation of the celebrity and the nature of the venue in which the celebrity enjoys and exploits the uh, celebrity. Don't expect angel-like behavior from an edgy actor or controversial musician. For example, uh, don't choose French actress uh, Charlotte Gainsbourg as a luxury brand ambassador if nudity, depiction of unsavory character, uh, profanity or the like are a concern uh, for the advertiser, as she has and uh, will most certainly continue collaborating with edgy film director Lars von Trier, with whom she shot porn fiction film Nymphomaniac. It's just an example, but if it doesn't suit your brand, then you cannot ask Charles Gainsbourg to stop her acting career because it may the, 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 um, damage your brand. Um, a celebrity will most likely carve out any behavior restriction insofar as it relates to a specific role they play in a film television show or on stage. So it, it's a matter of being realistic, and it's a matter of getting the right match. It is essential for luxury and fashion brands to choose celebrity endorsers who align with the values represented by their brands. If there is a misalignment, there is a risk of a celebrity's personal brand eclipsing the brand of the product or the company they were hired to promote. When properly done, an effective celebrity endorsement can have a massive payoff for a brand that far exceeds the cost of creating and building that relationship with a celebrity. The most successful athlete endorsement campaign in history and one of the most successful celebrity endorsement relationships of all time is the long-running association between Nike and Michael Jordan. The Air Jordan shoes have already, have always, um, are always among sorry, the best-selling basketball shoes every year. Um, even though the celebrity has been out of the game for 10 years. The Jordan brand is now a brand of Nike, a branch of Nike, that has grossed more than $1 billion. The lesson is that a carefully selected celebrity partner and a well-structured endorsement deal can yield massive benefits for any company, especially those that sell branded consumer products, so fashion and luxury brands. The online environment where brand messages can go viral and be communicated far more broadly at a more affordable investment only fuels its potential. So how do you pick the right endorser for your brand? Well, um, you have to choose a celebrity which resonates, oh, sorry, who resonates with two audiences. The brand's core demographic, i.e. 
its current customers, and the brand's aspirational demographic, the target customers. Any brand, any company that can achieve those twin objectives, retain existing customers and acquire new customers, is a company that is going to be successful in the marketplace and on the balance sheet. Once the objectives are established and the endorsement model is determined, it's time to get started. To begin, conduct a thorough analysis of the company's core demographic and an analysis of celebrities that have the, the highest appeal ratings to that audience. Then repeat the same process with the company's aspirational demographics and identify celebrities that have influence with that audience. Finally, assess who the, stakeho who the stakeholders are in the arrangement outside of customers and prospects and analyze which celebrities of those two lists may need to be eliminated based on potential conflicts with those stakeholders. It is important to note that the stakeholders involved in the assessment include both distributors and retailers. Um, this, the selection of the celebrity should actually enhance those relationships with distributors and, uh, and retailers. If the retailers of your target audience will, um, uh, uh, if the retailers of your target audience really wants to be associated with a particular artist, they would be thrilled. If a company from whom they purchase, they purchase product has a deal with that artist, and there is a, um, the same principle, sorry, holds true for distributors who may have their own self-promotional motives for wanting to align themselves with products endorsed by particular celebrities. Your employees' morale as well will go up if um, a, uh, they are excited about the celebrity which represents the brands. And companies uh, tend to demand more from celebrities they tap. In many cases, celebrities can no longer fly in for a commercial shoot and then have nothing to, more to do with the brand. Now, nowadays, there are marketers ask that they hobnob with employees, distributors and consumers. Once this analysis is complete, once we found the um, endorsers who, uh, who are uh, appropriate for your brand, it's just a matter of scheduling meetings and working through the two target lists until the company's lawyers are able to work out a mutually satisfactory agreement with individuals who best align with your brand's values. So, what is it that you need to get protecting as a brand? Morals clause. That's essential. An endorsement contract should state that a celebrity will not say anything defamatory or derogatory about the brand or the product sector and that they will not engage in any activity or conduct in such a manner which might bring the brand, the ad agency, or the campaign into public disrepute or offend public morals. All statements regarding the endorsement should also be pre-approved by the brand. The morals clause can be one of the most sensitive provisions in a celebrity endorsement. Celebrities hate them. Brands must have them. But um, what happens in case of tax fraud or a bar room brawl or minor offences or charges for serious offences that are later dropped? Should that, that be included in the morals clause? Well, it depends. It's down to the negotiation of the parties. But what, my word of advice for brands is never um, uh, never agree to con conviction as a trigger to exercise the morals clause. The length of time between criminal charge and a conviction of the of a celebrity can be longer than the term of the contract. So it's important for brands to actually find some quantitative, some some um, some tangible ways of identifying the type of behaviours that they will not agree to. This morals clause should permit termination of the contract if the endorser decides to use Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, etc. to tweet, post, or upload offensive comments and materials. Exclusivity obligations, we've already mentioned this, but uh, basically it's a matter of uh, the celebrity not wearing some products that uh, uh, your competitors have, uh, have, um, uh, have, have produced. And uh, an interesting story about that is Charlize Theron, Ther 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 uh, who was photographed on a number of uh, high-profile events wearing a dual watch in breach of her exclusive uh, contract with Swiss watchmaker Raymond Vale. Well, I suppose they terminated the agreement under the breach of the exclusivity clause. Reverse morality clause. Well, it's all very well, you know, for the brands to absolutely, absolutely uh, request and, and, and demand that morals clause. But what do um, um, celebrity agents and, and celebrity themselves ask in return? Well, they ask for a reverse morality clause. 
And therefore, um, they don't want to be associating the celebrities with a corporate partner uh, who, for some reason, goes through a turmoil, a product recall, major lawsuit, corporate scandal, or even the fact that it is busted uh, using child labor to make uh, its products. So, to protect themselves from that, celebrities want to have a reverse morality clause where they, they can terminate the agreement on this basis. Suspension and termination. Another key clause to include in an endorsement agreement to protect a, um, a, a brand relates to termination and suspension. Under what circumstances can the brand terminate or suspend the endorsement agreement with a particular celebrity? As mentioned before, more endorsement agreements includes a, a, a more endorsement, most endorsement agreements, sorry, includes a morals clause, which will allow the brand to terminate or suspend the agreement if a celebrity engages in conduct that is criminal or morally reprehensible. As an alternative to termination, consider including a right of suspension. Company obligations are suspended and the term of the contract is extended by the duration of the suspension. In the event of extended injuries, suspension by a governing body, think about Suarez, he's been bad for the game for uh, nine games, or any other negotiated moral clause event. Sometimes, if you can't get this termination, this particular event, you can use a suspension. However, be sure to um, define criminal and morally reprehensible behavior. As I was saying before, what the brand finds morally reprehensible, Lindsay Lohan may not. I'd like to talk to you about a case which came up uh, quite recently, Medan Hall versus Haynes. I'm sure you've heard about this American uh, uh, brand, Haynes, that does a lot of uh, t-shirts, and they also own the brand Champion, champion. and uh, Rashad Medenhall uh, plays professional football as a running back for the Pittsburgh Steelers in America, and he entered into a, an endorsement agreement with Haynes Brand, parent company of Champion. The agreement between Haynes Brand and Medenhall had a morals clause, which originally said that Haynes Brand could terminate the agreement if Medenhall was arrested, charged with, or indicted for a felony or a crime involving moral not turpitude. This clause was later amended to provide that Haynes Brand could terminate the contract if, in addition to being charged with or indicted for a crime, Mendenhall became involved in any situation or, or occurrence tending to bring Mendenhall into public disrepute, contempt, scandal, or ridicule, or tending to shock, insult, or offend the majority of the consuming public. Haynes Brand's decision on all matters arising under the section shall be conclusive. That was the new wording added to the contract. Mendenhall's tweeted, um, when um, President Obama informed the world that uh, Osama bin Laden had been uh, uh, killed by, uh, by his uh, uh, forces. Um, so Medanol posted a series of tweets decrying the joy that people expressed about this incident as follows. So he tweeted, what kind of a person celebrates death? It's amazing how people can hate a man that never even, that a man they never even heard speak. We've only heard one side. I only believe in God, I believe we are all his children, and I believe he is the one and only judge. There is not an ignorant bone in my body, I just encourage you to think, with a hashtag on the world think. Not unsurprisingly, Medanol's tweets generated a negative reaction, especially in America. He issued an explanation saying that he was encouraging people to think. His tweets were meant to generate conversation. Well, Haynesbrand didn't really think it that way, and they issued a statement saying that um, his statements, Medanhall's statements, were inconsistent with the champion brand, and they therefore terminated the, uh, the um, endorsement contract. Medanhall sued, asserting that Haynesbrand's termination was a breach. What the court said was that, um, despite the fact that Haynesbrand said that the contract vested it with discretion to terminate the agreement, and this decision should be second, second, shouldn't be second-guessed by the court. The court disagreed and said that this discretion is constrained by Heinz Brand's duty of good faith and fair dealing. It is now down to Mendenhall to show that uh, Heinz Brand's actions were unreasonable, unreasonable or in bad faith. And um, basically, the court was quite supportive of the fact that, as per the wording of this endorsement clause, it was uh, not clear cut uh, the fact that uh, Hensbrand could terminate the, the, the contract on the, on the basis of those tweets. Those tweets didn't show that um, Medenhall had basically 
uh, antagonize the whole public, etc., etc. So now it's down to Medan Hall to actually prove to the court, probably the second the, the appeal court, to prove to the court that um, the Haynes brand has, uh, um, sorry, that Patty's tweets were, were actually just a, um, a way to, to, to show his, uh, his, uh, his opinion and they were not, they were not basically publicly damaging the brand. So, clawback or liquidated damages. So this is a suggestion, but it's very difficult to actually have it in the contract because celebrities really, really don't want to have this. We, we learned before that um, it's possible to actually stagger the payment of, uh, of uh, the payments made to the, to the celebrity, especially to, to, to make sure that they would complete their endorsement obligations until the end of the contract. But something which is even more cunning, but even more effective, is to get a core clawback clause. Let's go back to um, um, uh, Lance Armstrong. Lance Armstrong made 15 to 20 million dollars in 2012 from all his endorsements. When the scandal came out that he had been doping all the way through his career, um, the, all his endorsement deals were uh, terminated. <coughs> so he's probably, he didn't make any income in 2013, he's definitely not going to make any income um, in 2014. He's now been banned for life. Uh, by the Federation of Cyclists or something. Um, so, if Lance Armstrong had a clawback claw clause in, uh, in, his, uh, in his agreement, he would have had to pay back all the money, some part of the money, that he actually had to earn, uh, thanks to the brands, during the previous years. And um, it's very difficult to have this type of clawback clauses set out in agreements with major uh, sports people like um, a um, Tiger Wood or a, a, um, a Nance Armstrong, fair enough, it's difficult. So maybe this is something you can get with a, um, a second, second ranked um, artist, or sorry, second art sports person. Second ranked sports person is maybe easy, easier if they have uh, uh, less, uh, less clout. But nonetheless, I think that all these brands um, who had, which had uh, endorsed um, uh, Lance Armstrong, if they had negotiated for a clawback clause and they had seen the reluctance of Lance Armstrong to include it, I think it would also have given them the, uh, some, 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 um, some idea that perhaps something was wrong. Why does this guy want to, doesn't want to have a clawback clause? If he was completely clean, um, why would he be reluctant to have that? Another thing that needs to be done if you want to have a clawback clause is that you need to be, uh, to have some very clear terms in your endorsement agreement as to uh, what type of <coughs> events are going to trigger the termination and the clawback. So um, again, this is down to the lawyers to do a good job and to make sure that the artist or the celebrity or the sports person is going to be reassured that he, um, in any case, doesn't engage in the type of behaviors which are going to trigger the clawback clause. But I think that's good for thought, this, uh, this type of clauses. So the brand may look to insure itself against the risks. There are policies such as uh, death, disability, and disgrace insurance that can provide some recompense. They can be very expensive, and obviously they do not protect the perception of the brand by the public, only the money spent on the endorsement. Um, if a celebrity's death would significantly impact the marketing program, consider obtaining a suitable life insurance policy, something like a key person policy to cover this risk. Consider similar issues about the celebrity's disability or injury. Now, I'd like to talk to you about uh, a story that uh, uh, an insurance broker told me two weeks ago in Paris. He said that um, he basically his niche market is to insure companies who do events. So, for example, it's, um, it's the, um, the one of his clients is Franco Dragon at Cirque du Soleil. But he also insures um, luxury brands. And he was telling, he was telling you about uh, um, Lockheed Moss and the impact of Lockheed Moss incident on uh, Christian Dior. Basically, they had booked a campaign with uh, Moss, and it was about to be released in 2005, but boom, all the London tabloids, sorry, the British tabloids, um, ran the story about her, her doing coke. And so therefore, there was a massive crisis management going on at Dior, and um, um, he actually helped them to use their insurance policy to be able to pay for the cost of the billboards, that they had already bought, and they were left blank for a few days, because they had to find another product to put in there, as we couldn't. They couldn't run the ad with uh, with Nick Moss in it, therefore, um, and and this this insurance, this great insurance, 
was used by GL to actually um, um, do some, some, some risk management on this, uh, on this end. Another very important thing to do for brands while they are basically entering to the contract with celebrities is to do some on ongoing monitoring. Offline, online. In the age of digital media, a celebrity's image can quickly be tarnished, having a knock-on effect of, of bringing the brand whose products he or she endorses into disrepute. For example, Axel Despegere, she's a 17-year-old uh, um, Belgian girl and she's a World Cup fan. She had a modeling deal with L'Oréal and it was terminated after photos of a team cheering Belgium went viral during the FIFA World Cup. Uh, fans were outraged where, when um, uh, Axel's, Axel posted a photo of herself on Facebook in which she's holding a rifle, proudly sitting behind what appears to be a dead oryx she shot while hunting. The caption, in reference to a World Cup match, read, Hunting is not a matter of life or death. It's much more important than that. This was about one year ago. Ready to hunt Americans today. Ha ha. After feeling the heat from fans, Axel apologized in the comment section of her post, saying, I didn't mean to offend anyone. It was a joke. But L'Oréal wasn't laughing, actually. And uh, they issued a statement saying, um, We only used her on an ad hoc basis to produce a video for social media use in Belgium. Uh, the contract has now been completed. So, as a brand, you need to monitor the press, social medias, blogs, check the behavior or reports of behavior of your endorsers. Um, some brand damage mitigation measures also should be in place. In the event that the celebrity's behavior has a detrimental effect on the brand, the contract should include obligations on the celebrity to cooperate and use their best efforts to minimize any brand damage. For example, attending a press conference, releasing, releasing statements at the brand's owner's request. Lastly, the brand should have a pre-planned crisis management media strategy. The immediate response should be to try to gain some control over how a damaging story is handled and to establish whether or not the allegations are true. Next, the brand needs to decide whether to stand by its celebrity or not. For example, Nike dropped uh, Nance Armstrong because he had been doping all his life and basically his activities in relation to his field uh, were uh, deemed to be misbehavior, but Nike did not drop Tiger Woods because all his uh, uh, womanizing was not related to the way he was playing golf. So, um, although I did hear that um, Nike um, slashed uh, the value of his deal, of Tiger Woods' deal. So, but he's still with Nike. To conclude, brands need to be better prepared than ever in the digital age. That means doing proper due diligence at the outset, engaging an experienced professional to negotiate the contract, and pl planning an effective media strategy if a crisis materializes. There are risks associated with uh, celebrity endorsement deals, since they are centered around human, human beings, all of whom are flawed. But with the right research, careful strategizing, and sad contract negotiation terms, a successful celebrity endorsement deal can power a brand, new or old, to extraordinary levels of success. Any questions? I think one of, one of the challenges, and you sort of touched on this, is um, when you're looking at a, a brand that has uh, quite a, a core audience and a target audience. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen examples of relatively uncool brands wanting to gain a new audience by partnering with quite an edgy musical artist. Um, and they deem that an edgy musical artist will open them up to a new audience, which is true. But then they try to impose you know, highly restrictive clauses around how that artist may have behaved in the past and how they may behave in the future. I've heard in situations where clauses have been imposed around, you know, you can be warrant you've never taken any drugs or got drunk or been forced any fights. And, a complete misunderstanding of how a lot of certain rock and roll bands behave. Um, <laughs> and I, uh, what well, they were not speaking, speaking to Pete Doherty, then, yeah? Well, not quite. But just the idea of, you know, we, we want to do something edgy. You know, we're a relatively boring FMCG brand. We want to be edgy. Mm. Yeah, our lawyers want to impose all these completely unrealistic um, uh, conditions on a rock and roll band. And this work you know, out, how, how, how do you help clients manage that disconnect between? You know, the kind of corporate compliance route versus what marketing wants to do and do something quite edgy. 
But I think this is common sense, it's not being legal. Uh, it's common sense. I mean, what are your priorities, guys? Um, this, there are things you can't negotiate. I mean, you, you can't change a person. Um, and there are things that may decide to compromise on. Be artists, uh, maybe take less drugs or something, but it's diff very difficult to actually really change the behavior somewhere. So if this person doesn't actually um, um, have a, the same values as the brand, and you're not ready to, to, to take a ton of them, then just don't negotiate it. Don't, don't waste your time and money and energy um, you know, uh, having some lawyers billing for you negotiating this while it's not going to... What are your priorities? What is the most important? Uh, do you actually want to have them? Are you, are, uh, is that your most important priority? Um, is it do you want to increase yourself? Do you think that you have the potential? Or actually do you want to, uh, do, do, do you want to basically not, not uh, frustrate your uh, core consumer base um, who would be, who could become offended by these uh, brand, brand endorsements? I guess it's, it's more common sense than legal to speak. And, um, and I think it's just having a reality check with your client. Well, it's, I, I often say it's, it's a tension in, within brands between legal and marketing. Fair point, um, very fair point. And uh, it's often quite difficult one to resolve. Yes. Have I answered your question? Well, yes, I know, but it's, it's something I see a lot. From a legal standpoint, yeah. I am afraid there's, there's not, I mean, what do you think, Benedict? So you may have a view of that. Benedict, by the way, is the IP General Counsel of Chanel. You can need to be yourself to be here today. Um, the, the fact that, of course, creative people in the desert that care about all of the future risks and that, but I think that it is uh, anyway, if you have one bad case, <laughs> uh, everybody will move in the right way because I think that nobody can be um, uh, not concerned by a bad buzz on the internet. And I feel that nowadays the press wait after that to pull a buzz. And for a brand, brand image and reputation is the, the key, the key issue. To so I feel that if we discuss and if we uh, are able to to take the priority on the risk, yes. we will find better deal for the long term. Because as you say, I think that this kind of endorsement is a long-term um, contract and negotiation. You cannot change the face every year if you want to have a strong uh, brand and a strong uh, relationship between the consumer and the brand. Because it's a, a kind of authenticity and a good partnership needs to be uh, a long-term one. So. Mm -hmm. This is the answer from a lawyer who completely understands, mm -hmm. you know, the um, uh, marketing and the painting of the brands. Thank you so much, Vicky. Mm -hmm. Yes, so typically what I found is in contracts with respect to the detrimental effect on the brand language, getting into the dirty details, that language seems clear, but what does it really mean? And from the celebrity side and the brand side, typically the, the both parties do not want to put in specifics. They don't want to put in metrics. You know, is it, does it require that the brand sales actually decrease after this event? And I found in our practice that that's a really tricky area from all the perspectives, from a marketing perspective, from a legal perspective, from either side of the aisle. And I'm wondering, you know, what your experience has been. Well, uh, there are some key metrics which can be used which um, are quite objective, such as, for example, the um, Q index, which uh, measures the uh, personality um, yeah, rate of, uh, of, of, the per, uh, of, uh, of the celebrity. So that would be quite useful. It would be quite good to actually say, well, if the uh, Q uh, index of this particular celebrity <coughs> has dropped by 30, 40%, then uh, we, we have an option to terminate it terminate the agreement. Um, of course, if there is a, um, anything related to a criminal conviction or a criminal uh, criminal charges, I think that this is also very objective. You know? we, I think the brand should, should be able to terminate <coughs> them for some time. They do ask for that. Um, I think those are probably some examples of objective metrics that can be used. Are you aware of any other um, metric that can be used? Okay. The sales metric is particularly difficult. Yes. Because first you have to prove causation, you know, that it was the celebrity that caused 
the actual production in the sales of the brand, which is typically very, very difficult. So my experience sales are not used. So that's that's where it's come become very, very tricky in the negotiations, even though everyone recognizes that there has been something negative performed, you know, Maybe. by the celebrity. Maybe in the future we will also see, you know, you know nowadays you've got some um, um, SEO tools, so search engine optimization tools, which can celebrate the fact of the celebrity or, or any person on the internet, on social medias, etc. Could be quite interesting also to ha have as a, um, you know, the monitoring of the fact of a particular celebrity on the, on, on this, uh, this sort of software, which measure the celebrity of a music band online, for example, as it's called Music Metrics. Um, so, so you can actually double check whether that celebrity or that artist or music fan is doing very well. Well, if you let the brand your um, uh, the, 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 the brand have a look at these uh, these metrics, for example, released by Music Metric, uh, then you can also have a um, an objective measurement of, of uh, the clout and uh, and uh, reputation of the celebrity out there. Um, so I suppose also with uh, sorry, the technical evolution. And, and um, yeah, technical evolution will become so increasingly easy to have these uh, metrics in place. And as I said, this Q index as well is quite good to measure personality health. But, but so, the, the different metrics, when Jarvis Cocker yeah. read his book at Michael Jackson, his stock in the music world went up, whereas uh, I'm sure someone Brad was actually uh, tied up with that Jarvis Cocker that went down. So what was good for the musician may not be necessarily good for the, 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 the brand that is. I'm sorry, I'm not sorry. Would you mind just explaining what John Scott did in relation to the It was a big, uh, I think it was, it was a big sort of music uh, fest there, uh, awards and that thing. Right. Michael Jackson was just a boy. Died. Just, uh, he, he was the big top you know, celebrity guy. Just at the start of the thing, John Scott had a bad up, dropped his pants and waited. Mm -hmm. Michael Jackson is destroying the sore of Michael Jackson. <laughs> and obviously, everybody thought Charles was he high? Was he high? No, no, he was just, he was just a bit of a demonstration. He thought, right. he thought Michael Jackson was a pants action. Uh, but uh, Charles Cockman, who was behind him, you know, pretty top guy, yeah. he went up big. But obviously, embarrassed Michael Jackson, but also Charles Cockman was with some sort of uh, mobile phone brand as well. Oh. They dropped them. Well. They dropped him. However, he, he stopped as a musician. Right. So, Oh, so sometimes you mean they don't have conflict of interest yeah. between what yeah. is good for the yeah. brand as a good for the musician, as a, but as an artist. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I mean, I can understand the brand. I mean, mooning to the audience, like very major award, it's not gonna, it's not definitely you know, in the corporate environment. That's something that you would do. I mean, I don't know, what, what am I supposed to say? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a good example. Some. Uh, I fully agree with that because as a brand owner, you would like to be able to terminate the argument. And not to depend on this type of index on sales or yeah. on, uh, on the ambassador celebrity because you, yeah, you want to cut it off and no more, not to have any more association with, with this yeah. guy. So mm. uh, I would prefer to have a pretty soft termination clause. And if, if this person wants to sue us and get some money, again, okay, we could fight after, but the most important thing is to really clear cut yeah. and not to, to have to wait for. Mm. Very true, and I think this is why the sales metric is not good because basically the accounts that are going to leave the balance sheet in you know six months time, one year time, it's too late. A lot of brands they want to be almost um, you know just after the event they want to be able to say well that's it we're dropping it. Um, it's been done with Tiger Woods, it's been done with uh, Lance Armstrong almost um, as well as as well a few days after the uh, triggering event they just want to terminate. Um, so, so the sales metrics is just not, I, I don't think it's really um, envisageable because, because that means that you'll have to wait another six months or a year to get back to your accountants. So, um, so that's, that's good for thought. Um, and one thing regarding sales metrics, of course, a good communication plan depends on the PR and media investment. And I feel that if you are the, the right Talent, but you do not invest enough in PR and in media. It is also the brand to to make the, the launch and the, the the things happen. And it is why I am not comfortable by allowing Royal Royal Steel uh, 
is a percentage of the sales. Between the link between the performance of the talent and, uh, and an artist and the link of the sales, it became a, a big nightmare <laughs> when you have a problem like, uh, like that. And I feel that there is two separate things. There, there is the business and, and the sales and the communication program. And so, um, percentage of royalties, I don't know here, um, deals with that, but uh, we try to avoid to make uh, any percentage on the sales. You're already functional. Just one thing I wanted to say thank you so much for your comments, uh, uh, Nicola and Benedict. Just some, something I wanted to say as well. Uh, yes, sometimes when uh, a celebrity or a sports person has done something wrong, Brands don't really feel comfortable to um, to let him go or let her go terminate while he or she is down, uh, already beaten up big victims of the uh, of of the lumping from the press, etc. In social media, so um, I agree with what Nicola said. Sometimes it's quite good to actually let this person go in quite way, etc. And I would also suggest perhaps that um, instead of having a um, also, the other the other risk of this, you know, if you, if you just terminated the contract with celebrity who was already or a uh, brand was also was already down in the pain of the ah, I did this and now I'm just being condemned uh, condemned by everyone, um, is the risk of being sued, um, in, especially in border borderline situations such as uh, men and head, as I was saying, and the and the Haynes brand champion. This this was a very borderline situation. So why not include a, perhaps an arbitration clause um, instead of uh, a a um, competence courts clause, so that you can actually have um, every in issue uh, litigation issue being looked at by a, a, an arbitration uh, uh, committee, and so therefore it's, it, it is perhaps more in, 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 in costly than litigation. At least everything is secret and uh, is dealt with much more quickly than uh, in court. So, what do the general counsels in the room think about that? Having an arbitration clause? It's probably in line. More than ninety percent of our arguments are. That's that's to protect the brand's reputation, etc. It is, yeah. But in terms of sales, something that is interesting and it's pretty new, and we don't have it, but uh, I hear it a lot from a few places. Uh, more and more, some ambassadors are asking to get termination rights uh, if they are not promoted enough by the brand. Oh. I know a few brands where they were able to get an ambassador, but they have to provide some warranty in terms of spending or in terms of media. So it was okay, I join you, but there are also this ambassador and sportsman are trying to build their own brand and say, okay, I join your company, I sign an agreement with you, but I want you to spend at least X amount using my face in this part of the world. And this is pretty new for me. Uh, we never face it, but I know that a few colleagues have it. I think Amy has something yeah, else I can that. speak to that. That is, it is pretty common in the States for the celebrity to require certain advertising and promotional spend and require not only a percentage, um, which typically works out to be a percentage of sales, but uh, a specific type of spend and a specific placing of spend. So, you know, it's if, if you're using the ambassador next to the product, in point of sale materials, they want control over how that's going to appear, where it's going to appear, when it's going to appear. Wow. So they get quite detailed about the spend. It's not just enough to have an SMR, satellite media tour, for instance, on the various media. They are getting very, very specific with uh, their requests, and with the, and this then it, this gets into the tracking of the request, and the, and the brand has to be sure that they've got the ability to effectively track it otherwise you know the brand will say well yes we spent it and the celebrity will say well tell me how and where mm -hmm. so it involves more than just the con contractual language it involves the backup and being able to uh, show that you've been uh, doing that spend and also perhaps tracking the results mm -hmm. so it involves more of an investment than you might ordinarily think in just the x percent uh, of the spend but you have to have backup to the systems as well so Yes. Thank, Thank you so much. I've only seen that in the States. Thank you so much for your comments and uh, uh, very insightful co content. Okay. <laughs>
Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs>